let me just say my sincere thanks for inviting me to participate in, in this very special uh, meeting. I mean, not many of us get to go to 150th birthdays, and uh, in fact, none of us get that off of very often. But, <laughs> but it is a, a tremendous honor, and I thank you for including me uh, in the program. Uh, and of course, congratulations to you. Well, the task that I've just been set was different from how I was going to introduce my talk, uh, as you can imagine. I don't worry as a synthesis chemist about having and being able to beat bugs and enzyme systems. I worry when you combine those with Frances Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> she has made, obviously, uh, the, the world as advanced by coupling of those two individuals, which does make the competition extremely tough. But I hope what you'll see in my presentation, that I don't see it as a synthetic chemist versus, let's say, an enzyme chemist or an evolution, evolutionary chemist in the process, or biologists. I see ourselves very much as scientists, and it's creating that new science that I think we should get excited by. Now, I don't know if you, like me this morning, I was actually very humbled by some of the things that were said by our previous speakers. And indeed, not just humbled, but I think inspired as well uh, to think that scientists do have a really important role to play. And we can take great pride, in fact, in, in what we will hopefully achieve over the next years. And I think one area is certainly sustainable food and food sources are going to be where we will, as scientists, have a tremendous impact. Now, I do realize we have a fairly general audience here today, um, and therefore I need to keep my comments relatively general. I will, though, towards the end, show you some re genuine research slides. But I'm a synthesis chemist. I make molecules, and normally when a synthesis chemist talks to you, they like to emphasize the methods that they've discovered and developed to really make that next generation of compounds. And indeed, I, I follow that very often myself. But today I'm going to focus not really on the methods of synthesis, but the tools of synthesis, because I think there are dramatic changes needed to really develop the whole art of molecular assembly. We have not evolved our tools remarkably over many, even 100, of year, 100 years or so. We still use round bottom flasks, distillation columns, and all the paraphernalia of a typical synthetic chemist. Surely in a modern world, that's got to change, and got to change for the better. So really what we're about here is new thinking. And quite clearly, we shouldn't waste talented individuals who take 10, even more years to train as synthetic chemists and then use them in menial tasks or repetitive tasks or scale-up tasks. Surely, we should relegate a lot of those things and those tasks to our machines and allow people more time to think and design and be creative. And that's my ultra, ultimate aim is to really uh, protect and help the human resource, really, and not waste the human resource on these trivial tasks. So with that in mind, and this audience really uh, would recognize this instantly, that synthetic chemistry has played an enormous role in delivering functional molecules. And I'm proud of the fact that synthesis genuinely serves society as it does. But all this activity comes at a cost to our planet's resources. We genuinely have to get a lot better and more sustainable in what we do. Now, there are a number of ways of doing that. We can, for example, align ourselves with these principles of green chemistry or more sustainable practices. And these were enunciated some 20 years ago uh, by Warner and Anastas. And indeed, you could argue they've served us well as a charter for life, if you like, as a synthetic chemist. 
But even after 20 years, we don't have processes that would check all of these boxes. All of them, I think, are very sensible. They are all make good common sense. Uh, I mean, who wouldn't want to design uh, better chemicals or more atom efficiencies from the chemicals we have? Who wouldn't want to cut down dramatically on solvents? Who wouldn't want to minimize our synthesis steps in these processes? But is this list truly right for 2015? I, and I don't think it is. I think we should reflect on what today we would see as more principles of green chemistry and sustainable practices. And I think this list really does need to change, and I think over the 20 more years, it will evolve yet again. But let's have a look at what I think might be where some of these changes need to be made. Firstly, we've got to recognize that ac human activity will produce waste and often use a lot of energy. So it's really about not a, it's understanding the problem and really how we manage both waste and energy. How we can convert waste often into energy becomes really where some of the key issues really should be. But I think this other one, avoid labor-intensive practices. This is, again, how to protect the human resource the human resource, I think, is so vital, vitally important to creativity and how things are done into the future. We have to create more time to think, plan, and organize ourselves better. And, and other areas, we need to move to more sustainable feedstocks, obviously. Uh, we should be designing molecules for their whole life cycle, not just for function and immediate function. We should think about them when they get into the environment or the metabolic uh, byproducts of some of the things we make and uh, really the issues associated with that. We must understand our molecules from when we first make them and when they first exist on this planet. We also, I think, need to move past some of our conventional knowledge we have to challenge the dogmas of the past. If we're going to discover new reactivity, we have to ask much more difficult questions about our basic training and whether there are fascinating opportunities that will step change where we are today by creating new types of functional reactivity, not simply evolving a process chemically one improvement at a time. We have to change that really fundamentally, I, th I think, in the process. Now, I do apologize for the next slide, but not a lot. <laughs> Synthesis is a complicated business. You do have to go through many complex decisions that you have to make. And as I said, it can take many years to train a good synthetic chemist before they can even practice or even begin to think how to make and design a synthesis and of a molecule. So, with that in mind, it's a bit like juggling with hundreds of balls in the air at one time. And if you drop one of them, the whole synthesis can fail. It's a serious issue. So you have to have a great understanding, not just of the knowledge base behind synthesis, but also the skill base that's behind any synthesis process. Even thinking what to make is a non-trivial problem. You might be designing in a property or a function into that molecule. That requires phenomenal physical and physical chemical understanding. You may be making single molecules or families of molecules. You might even be making a natural product, a natural product that's not particularly available from natural sources, but one that you think could inspire a new generation of agrochemicals or pharmaceutical agents, for example. And synthetic chemists can tackle those sort of problems. Even testing a, hy a biological hypothesis may be a reason to make molecules. And it moves past a plan to reaction conditions through monitoring, and then you end up at the end of the process with having to clean up that molecule. And that's the worst and downside of most modern synthetic programs is this reaction workup and purification. 
There were lots of downstream tools needed to improve ourselves in that area alone. Often we do one chemical step and yet take 20 steps or 20 unit operations to purify our materials. These are terribly inefficient processes that if the synthesis world is going to survive effectively, it has to be able to solve those types of issue. Now we can tackle the problem in a number of ways. Let, because I'm interested in natural products, let, let's think of natural products because natural products have served us extremely well. They are often, and inspired us, they are often the precursors for novel agrochemicals, as we've already seen this morning, or pharmaceutical agents. 65% of our drugs in the top 200, for example, are inspired by some natural product process, binding to a unique receptor or affecting some sort of uh, novel output. We copy nature all the time to build our molecules. So we need to be good enough as synthetic chemists to be able to make molecules even better than nature would make them, our natural products. Now that is a big challenge, but today we're getting to that point where we, not just in time, but in volume and in competition, we can actually now think of making molecules like the epothelones, which are anti-tumor agents, better than anything we can do by using all the armory uh, of sort of modern molecular biology. So synthetic chemistry has advanced quite significantly. And I could show you many programs. I mean, the, the avamectins are clearly molecules where you can argue uh, nature has been an inspiration. Uh, avomectins have been, and melbomycins have been exploited by many, many companies as anthelmintic agents and control agents. But in synthetic terms, a molecule of this level of complexity really is a challenging, at the frontiers really, of molecular synthesis even today. But we can do this as synthetic chemists because we can recognize we can build a molecule up in terms of modular building blocks. And each of those modular building blocks may be designed to make the natural product, but they could also be designed to make a whole series of unnatural products and natural products that may have greatly improved properties over their natural counterparts. And that's why synthesis plays such a key role here in this process. And in something like this, for the connoisseurs of synthesis, this synthesis took us into whole new realms of making carbon bonds at anomeric centers, which are incredibly difficult things to do under uh, previous types of conditions. Multi-steps were required. We use novel linchpins to bring the molecule together. We've used pyallel chemistry to deliver pyranones, the sugar components of the avamectins. There's all sorts of an array of discovery that's made as a result of working on a complex synthesis program of this type. And it's those discoveries, it's what you learn by the process is what advances science. It's how you take those methods forward will advance our subjects in making uh, novel materials of all types. So it's the methodology of the approach, not necessarily the Everest the climbing exercise to just make the natural product goal itself. But let's say we're pretty good at what we do as synthetic chemists. And I think, uh, as I said earlier, we do serve society in terms of making functional materials. But how to get better, and not just get better, but get much better? Well, it is tempting indeed to now compare ourselves of the flask versus the cell since we've had the competition uh, set to me, I've put this slide in to recognize where the good bits and the bad bits are, because both have their good, their bad, and the ugly components associated with them. Now, the flask has been around for, let's say, 150 years. It's pretty effective at what it's done. We have a wide range of reactions, massive diversity, versatility. Uh, we have established protocols that work in a very general way. We can pretty well make anything if we have enough resources to do so. But there are limits. It doesn't always work in, in aqueous media, although that's not a limitation so much anymore. And we get probably 
poor product management and waste management. The downstream of synthesis is a big issue, and I've pointed that out before. But what about a cell? How does that do? Well, I haven't, as I say, factored in the Francis Arnold component, which I will now do for you. It is highly efficient. We clearly recognize that. But it is actually quite limited in chemical scope, as we see it at the moment. Now, evolutionary techniques will, of course, greatly change that position. But at the moment, we saw the cyclopropanation reaction, but we could have a whole stream of reactions that uh, the cells don't do. Uh, the Suzuki reaction, the Grubbs meta or the metathesis type processes. These are key chemical transformations that revolutionize the chemical world. And these are things which we've got to try and get in to the full scope of cellular processes. But here's the attractive things. Let's not look at them from necessarily what it does, but let's look at them in terms of what they achieve. Cells make their own reaction catalysts, their own enzymes. That's an attractive synthetic concept, if you think about it. And when it's done its job, reagents are recycled. That's an attractive synthetic principle. Continuous molecule processing. That's really attractive as well. In batch, we make everything we want in one go and one, one shot but we take risks by that very process. Whereas if we could continually produce our molecules to order and use them as we make them, that becomes a different way of looking and probably cutting down on our chemicals um, uh, inventory, which is an attractive thing to do in itself. And reactions occur differently. They occur in compartments or on surfaces. We ought to be able to exploit that principle very nicely in synthesis as well. And of course, we know it works in aqueous media and other medias for that matter. But you have to say it's not robust to a, to a complete environment of very harsh conditions. And that certainly would be a limit. And of course, a dead cell at the end of the day is not innocent. That is something that uh, really you also have to think about in terms of um, the waste products that get produced by these processes. But it's pretty good. So can a synthetic chemist get somewhere in between these two worlds? Well, you can, actually, if you start to think about the dynamics of what we've just seen. We can certainly go down in scale, maybe using microfluidic processes. We can cut glass chips with channels not bigger than a human hair. Well, not much bigger even than a red blood vessel. And we can coat that with reagents. And when I talk about reagents, they can be enzymes or immobilized enzyme systems as well. So this is a reactor that we're creating in this process. We can load it with uh, input chemicals, and we'd anticipate that on that chip it would carry out a chemical transformation. And indeed it does. But the dynamics of that are tremendous. Let me give you an example. A Wittig reaction, for those, uh, those non-chemists in the room, this is a process, very important strategic reaction. It won a Nobel Prize. It's got to be a good reaction. It takes, it takes about one hour to go at room temperature in a batch, one second on a chip. A Suzuki reaction, another very strategically important process, six hours at 60 degrees, seven seconds on my chip. In other words, the whole dynamics of synthesis could change very dramatically. We can't even analyze our reactions at that speed today. This means synthesis of materials could be evolve in a very much faster way. So instead of simply then making something and overanalyzing it as we tend to, maybe we could carry that molecule on to screen it for function say, biological function, before we even analyze its structure. That's a different dynamic to how we go about chemistry today. So this idea of linking making with function is really attractive. And this, this coupling of these sciences is really, I think, how a lot of this science is going to go. It certainly works going down in scale. We can uh, print out the... Uh, 
synthesis products onto microarray slides, roll proteins of interest over them, look for binding, and deconvolute to work out the chemical process that has taken place. Or we can use frontal affinity chromatography type techniques for protein binding. So a lot can be done by going down on scale that really magically changes the dynamics of synthesis as we know it. But no synthetic chemist just wants to make materials you can hardly see. They need to be able to make it on scale. Now, you'll all be aware of being in flow techniques. This company's important history of the Bourne Harbor process that we've heard about so many times in the early 1900s is a flow chemistry process. So what am I doing all these years later trying to impress you with the idea that flow and dynamics of flow can change the world. Well, on scale, nobody really in their right mind should think about not using continuous processing. And the world really is now moving in that direction for all our APIs and indeed making our molecules in the future are likely to be done in this continuous processing fashion. But the re research world has not really got there yet because it is a complex art, even, of making molecules. And it's very difficult to let, or impossible to automate a synthetic chemist. They're just too good. What you can do is help them with machinery. And that's what we're trying to do. So upscaling and multi-step processing becomes possible if you allow yourself different arrangements, uh, bigger reactor coils, for example, to do the flow processing. Immobilized reagents in cartridges, maybe, would be an attractive way of cleaning up in line as you're making materials. And if you used all modern machinery, you would be able to detect what you're making, use real-time diagnostics, and use that to make third, fourth, fifth, sixth different inputs. So in a sort of assembly line, you can start to see how you, in a clean way, on a machine, could actually be making functional products. And I have to remind you, nearly all of our functional materials that I talked about in one of my early slides are not made in a single step. They're made by multi-step processes. Often, ten, 10 steps can be required to make these materials. But today, machinery has now come available. You can buy this off the shelf, and it consists of pumps, uh, you can have columns, reaction flow coils, computer control comes into play, and you can control temperatures, anything from minus 90 to plus 350 degrees. Very versatile machinery, capable of a very vast range of chemical and enzymatic uh, transformations uh, by being able to appropriately load the machinery. This happens to be four channels where you can have four different reactions working side by side under totally different reaction conditions. Or you can have four processes operating where you're using optimizing protocols to achieve a chemical transformation. Other machinery, again, all integrated pumps, uh, control valves, uh, flow coils, columns, and computer control in quite compact units off the shelf. Uh, and these can now be linked up to really think about making uh, fully machine-assisted processes. Here's an example of what it would look like in real coupled style to make a multi-step synthesis. In this case, a fully coupled four-step process. Actually, it's making the molecule tamoxifen, <coughs> which is a front line uh, <clears throat> API for treatment of breast cancer. And on this one machine, it's producing 200 grams of material a day. That's equivalent to 20,000 doses of tamoxifen in a day on a small footprint reactor. Now take this forward to other things that you could make and scaling. This idea of being able to have machinery to make molecules that could be transported on the back of a truck anywhere in the world, even to address food or agrochemical problems on site. This flexible, 
continuous manufacturing principles are going to become very, very attractive moving forward into the future. And again, it's all machine-assisted synthesis by being able to link the machinery together and couple machines in this fashion. So, two questions. Let's see how good we are with the machinery now. And we can challenge ourselves with any level of molecular complexity. Uh, we have already shown we can make agrochemicals and drug substances by these processes. But can we get into this world of being able to be even competitive with some of the things that go on from natural, uh, control, natural sources and natural products? Can we actually make them now and can we integrate the science that we've already learned? Years of synthetic chemistry and making complex natural products. We're grossly frustrated by the need for early intermediates. There are always purification difficulties. There's irreproducibility as we scale up the process. We nearly always need a larger number of synthetic steps. There's often a lack of new methodology, I have to say, uh, developed in these processes, and the financial and the physical effort that we go through sometimes to make these compounds, you've got to ask whether that really is truly sustainable. On the other hand, flow chemistry does have a lot of advantages. I've talked about some of them, and I can talk for a long time about where these advantages accrue. So the real questions, I think, are how do we integrate the science now that we've discovered and is flow chemistry helpful in the synthesis of more challenging or complex molecules? These are two important questions, I think. So I think let's see how we do. Now, we started really some years ago on this, so I'm going to show you the first synthesis and then where we've got to today. So in 2005, 2006, this is the level of sophistication we could get to. Very simple chemical inputs coming together by using classical synthetic methods that we know to be reliable, but this time brought together by using all our reagents in an immobilized format in cartridge form. So we're, if you like, looking at this in a flow process, but we're using our reagents, normally the things that cause us downstream workup problems, they're fully immobilized, so they can be fully recycled often in the process. So the principles that we've been trying to get to can be made on the machine, used on the machine, and recycled on the machine. All those things we wanted to duplicate that a cell does very well, our machines will now do. And they will do multi-steps, and they will take a very wide range of substrates uh, and be very promiscuous in the building of the synthetic molecules. And it takes us through to uh, following even a biomimetic pathway to this final product, oxymeritidine, which is from the Amarillodaceae uh, class of molecules, important in their own biological right, but not readily available from natural sources. So again, it puts it, it back into the hands of the synthetic chemist to be able to make it. And in just seven steps, we can hook a synthesis together to produce that material. And there's some interesting things going on here. We need hydrogen. We don't use hydrogen gas. We use water and electrolyze it using, again, flow machinery, so-called H-cube, will deliver for us hydrogen into a reaction flow tubes. So again, innovation comes into play in terms of how we connect these things together. Now, not all was possible in terms of bond-forming processes. So, towards the end of this synthesis, we had to invent a new phenol oxidative process where we immobilized hypervalent iodine reagents to make those final, where I've marked it as a red bond, that final carbon-carbon bond. That's a very difficult bond to actually make, and certainly in synthetic terms we can make now in very, very high yield using these new types of immobilized reagent system. And then a final deprotection closes the molecule to the natural product. Now then, at the time, oh, and still is, 
a world record. Seven steps, all coupled together by a continuous flow process. But here's the competition. My top postdoc, I asked, right, you go in the lab and use your batch tools and make this molecule. And so they did, and they made this molecule. It took them four days to complete the synthesis. Now, four days is not bad for a molecule of that level of complexity uh, in the process. And not many years ago, 20 years ago, molecules not that much bigger could have earned you a PhD thesis. That's the sort of level of complexity we were talking about 20 years ago. Not, I have to say, today. How did the machine do? Well, about five hours is all that was needed for the machine to actually then assemble this product. Five hours against four days, I think, was a pretty effective demonstration of where we can get to with these new tools. But for us, this wasn't a great challenge because we understood about these immobilized reagent systems. We'd worked on them for many years before, but many have now become commercially available. But it looks like a very attractive modular way to set up to make molecules. But again, would really the advantages, where would they come from? The real advantages are being able to use microprocessor electronic control algorithms to be able to make the machinery talk to machinery and interact possibly through the internet or the internet of chemical things to be able to deliver then fully organized and self-correcting processes. Now that starts to bring a whole new element of synthesis. Instead of the synthetic chemist having to direct optimization programs, the machine now is capable of being inventive enough to be able to optimize chemical processes itself and then use those in a completely changing environment to improve itself as the synthesis progresses. But just how challenging could we get with this sort of methodology? That was really the question. So as a, as a chemist, and you're looking at natural products, let's just choose one that would be a significant challenge that would be, let's say, competitive with the very best of batch chemistry that goes on in the world today. Now, there are not a lot of groups in the world that can make truly large natural products. It's still a very tough business. So the competition here is against the very best in the world that make these big molecules. Let's show, see one. This mo these molecules, sporangins, they're polyketides. They have some interesting biological activity. This one, sporangin A, has been synthesized using classical aldol chemistry with one of my colleagues, Ian Patterson's brilliant synthesis, uh, using the methods that he's very much developed. But we came to this program and said, well, can a machine tackle this level of molecular complexity? Can it really make molecules with this level of functionality in a reasonable time? Actually, not in a reasonable time, better and quicker. Can we accelerate the synthesis compared with the classical bench chemist? And if we can, can we make molecular variation? Can we look at these other natural products, which are truncated versions, where the chain has been shortened, still with full biological activity? But there are two series of natural products from different parts of the world, which are not readily available from the biological extraction of these material. So there is a real challenge to us in synthetic terms to be able to make something of this level of complexity. That, we felt, was a worthy challenge for the new tools and the new techniques that we'd done. So, any chemist can come up with a plan of how to put these sort of things together in a modular sense. And we can work these back to recognizable and cheap starting materials, in this case, mannitol. We can see that as a nice chiral building block that we could take forward into the final natural product by a whole series of chemical steps, obviously. There are some attractive things going on here. I haven't really got time to talk about all the synthesis. 
and I'm well aware that many people in the audience, what I'm showing you here, a lot of chemical structures which look a little bit more like chicken wire than, than uh, real molecules. But I apologize to you for that. What I want you to understand is how we build the complexity into a synthesis program uh, and be able to have all these wonderful variations in the science that we do. So from the blue box, that would be a common intermediate, we felt, because we could then batch split that and go into the green and yellow material. And that would give us a highly efficient way of moving chirality from one substrate into two further key chiral building blocks that we would then want to couple and wrap up and assemble by some process to spirocyclize to the final natural product. But this idea of batch splitting in this sort of way and making both components is very, very efficient in synthetic terms. So that's what it looks like on paper. That's what it would look like in terms of chemical design. And as I say, it would take an experienced chemist to feel confident that they could really put this sort of molecule together using conventional methods. So it becomes scary for a machine then. And not only that, we're trying to design in reactions that we can use iteratively. In other words, can we use reactions that once we've learned about it, or the machine has learned about it, can we use those again and again and again to build bigger and bigger molecules or build in molecular variation? So this concept then of machine-assisted synthesis using the iterative processes is how we started to think about this synthesis. Now I'm gonna go through these, I've got just about a minute and a half to go to show you just how this can come together. So here we go. We can start with mannitol using chemistry that we invented to make acetals. We can transfer this through a whole series of cartridges. We can even build those reagents on those cartridges. We can see them happening in real time with webcams that will observe what is going on. We have invented new ways of bringing in gases into reactions through membrane reactors, and we've worked with Metal of Toledo to develop inline analysis methods. But we can build that blue box molecule in multigram quantities purely on a machine seven-step machine-assisted process. And we can then take that forward further on to much more molecular complexity. Ozonolysis reactions that we're going to use again and again. Dibar reactions we're going to use again and again. Rausch crotalation reactions we're going to use again and again. Protection, deprotection, all the things synthetic chemists do, we want to be able to iterate into these sequences. So that's built a fairly big substrate. We can continue that through to make the green box molecule uh, by using these immobilized systems, reactor flow coils, and again, uh, all the methodology that we've been talking about. We can make the other half as well, and there it all is on one slide to the box at the bottom is a yellow uh, molecule at the moment, where we've now made those two bits on the machine. So actually, well over 70% of this synthesis has now just been relegated to a machine processing. Complex science here, very complex synthesis, but relegated to a smart enough machine that can accommodate these processes. So with that in mind, can we now say we've done the job and the machine quits and says to the synthetic chemist, we've done our work. Uh, you take it on and do the final couplings and the really hard part of the synthesis. Or does still that synthetic chemist look at the program and say, you lazy machine, get back to work, go back and complete the whole synthesis? Well, we thought that was a bit tough. We thought the machine had done, uh, and machines had done a great job here in making about 70% of the synthesis. So the game was, can you now, the chemist, take these advanced materials which you could never buy and just complete that process in a much faster synthetic operation than normal. And indeed, sorry, the boxes have changed color here, but they're the two molecules at the top that have been synthesized by the machine, which we made in quite large quantities because it is this 
repetitive machine-assisted process that allows us to build scale as well uh, as complexity in the process. And then just simply gave it to the synthetic chemists for them to plumb together using methods that they developed to the first natural product and to the second natural product, that big one with that polyene side chain. So indeed, the synthetic chemists can come into play using conventional batch mode chemistry and integrate it with the flow-assisted or continuous processing methodology that the machines are so good at. I would have no doubt at all that we could do all of these steps in a fully integrated uh, flow, continuous processing fashion. But I think the statement that I'd like to make is that this really has advanced and changed how we think about assembling our molecules today, no matter what level of complexity. I've just chosen a highly complex example. It would have been much easier to have made all the small molecule inhibitors or agrochemicals that we all know about by using uh, these types of synthetic tools. But I want to end with one slide, if I may, which is this one, which is what my lab looks like today. And I'll be very quick on this because of the time. You may get the impression that I have a lab full of machines. Not a bit of it. I have a lab full of people and machines. And it's really important that what our machines have done is create time for those highly experienced people to design, make, and work, and discover and create new things. It's creating time for the human resource while the machines take care of more of these routine tasks. So all our equipment now is geared up as a machine-assisted process. But we're now using it to discover new reactions. We're integrating modeling. We're looking at fast op optimizing tools. The smart fume cupboard is with us today. Webcams in my lab are everywhere. All that information is ported directly through the internet to electronic lab notebooks. We're using a lot of open source software. We can monitor from our cell phones and our tablets all our reactions in real time and control those reactions anywhere remotely in the world. We can do that today. So with this and with all the new developing head-up displays, with the developing things in mass spec and NMR, there's a tremendous new world opening up in terms of being able to deliver synthetic sciences uh, going on into the future. And the whole thing is predicated on these advanced processing tools and methods that we're bringing together through the internet, I should say, of chemical things in how this is developing now. The ability of all the machinery to communicate with each other and with different devices through the internet and be able with neural networking and with modern technologies, hypercat linkages and the like, we're starting to get into a new world where the machines are going to be able to help us enormously in those elements of the routine and development processes of any modern synthetic program. So I will end there, acknowledge the people over many, many years who have done this work, and say that I believe this machinery has got a long way to go. This is the results of just a few years of work. Just think where we're going to get when we harness all the tools together, and I have to say, all the biochemical tools as well can be used on these types of advanced machinery. So with that, let me just say thank you once again for listening to me, and I do apologize for going over time, but I get very excited when I talk about these types of chemistry. Thank you. BASF. We create chemistry.